Oof, calculus folk, what do we think about this? Is this asking too much? I mentioned recently how the AP Calc exam is coming up in just a few weeks, so I paid special attention to this intimidating looking problem that I saw on Ask Math recently. In all my years of teaching AP Calculus and covering the college board materials, I've never seen them offer a limit quite like this. Of course, there's no reason to believe this comes from the college board materials, but just as a standard of comparison, this is a harder than average limit problem. And this is a bit of a forbidden limit, because apparently this post was removed from Reddit, I guess because the poster mentioned asking AI in his description here. But it's not like he wrote 160 books with AI and is trying to sell them on his Amazon storefront. But, I mean, who would do that? Anyways, I thought it'd be fun to show you how we can evaluate this limit without too much trouble. We just need to carefully apply some of our familiar limit laws, and it will crack without too much difficulty. Those of you who know some calculus are probably thinking one of two things right now. L'Hopital's rule, or sine x over x. When you take calculus, you will often encounter the limit of sine x over x as x approaches zero. And this is what we call an indeterminate form, because if we just tried to plug zero in for x, we would get sine of zero, which is zero, over x, which we're saying is zero. And if this is what you get when you try to substitute in the value that's being approached, then the limit could actually be anything. This is indeterminate because we can't determine the value of the limit from something like this. A common mistake is to say, oh, well, it's division by zero, so the limit doesn't exist. But no, this just means that you can't evaluate it using this strategy. Others might think, well, it's zero over zero, so it's basically just one, right? Well, not necessarily because it could be that x approaches zero really, really fast. So maybe this is actually infinity because sine x might be really big relative to x, even though sine x is getting smaller and smaller. On the other hand, sine x could approach zero way faster than x does, and so maybe this fraction approaches zero. Early on in a calculus course, students will usually go through a geometric proof that this limit is actually equal to one. You can also find the value of the limit by applying what's called L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule tells us that when we have an indeterminate form like this, we can evaluate the limit by taking the derivative of the numerator and denominator. The derivative of sine x is cosine x and the derivative of x is 1 and at this point we can plug in 0 directly without any issues cosine of 0 is 1 so it's just 1 over 1 and we get the limit of 1 which agrees with the geometric argument now no doubt there will be some nerds in the comment section telling me that applying L'Hopital's rule here is circular and that's fine it's just a quick way to figure out what the value is if you forgot so the key idea here is that we've got sine of a thing over that thing as the thing approaches zero. Now that's not exactly what we have going on here, so in order to make use of this known limit, we're gonna have to manipulate this guy a bit. But this is your last chance to pause the video and try evaluating this gnarly limit yourself. And if you are able to get it, you can pat yourself on the back because it is a bit of a tricky limit. Just for perspective, this is my first edition copy of Michael Spivak's Calculus, one of the most famous calculus textbooks in the world. It's partly famous for its very difficult problems, and if you flip to the exercises on limits, you will not find anything quite like the limit we're looking at today. Now, in fact, you'll find some more difficult problems that require proofs, and you'll see some epsilon delta stuff, uh, but anyways, you're not going to see what we're doing today. Spivak's calculus does get into some problems that look like our limit today in the derivative section, but these are derivatives, not limits that you're being asked to evaluate. For an even more famous textbook comparison, consider my first edition copy of James Stewart's calculus. And if we flip to the limit problems, you'll see that there is, again, no exercise that looks quite like what we're doing today. And this is my backup first edition Stewart calculus, we could also flip 
up to the Lope Tall section here, and you will find some trig limits, but again, nothing quite as ugly as the limit we're evaluating today. Here's one that looks a little bit similar though. Now, just because they're not as ugly doesn't mean they're not as hard. Let's jump into the solution, and you'll see that this limit from Reddit is not all too difficult. Though, I don't want to downplay it either. Certainly, as a high school calc class goes, even AP, I would consider this a challenge problem. Now, we're going to evaluate the limit with out Lope Tall's rule. You could use Lope Tall's rule, and those of you familiar with the rule might be like, are, are you kidding? I mean, we'd have to apply it like a hundred times to get this X to go away. However, you could finagle this a bit so that one application of Lope Tall's rule would set you up pretty nicely. But let's get into our solution. The first thing we're going to do is take a exponent of 10 off of this sign and off of this x to the 100 in the denominator. So now instead of sine to the 10 in the numerator, I just have sine, and instead of x to the 100 in the denominator, I just have x to the 10. All of this then needs to be raised to the power of 10. Keep in mind, this is a single sine function. It's not sine times two sine. This is a sine function with this junk inside of it. So this exponent would just hit that sine function, giving us the sine of 10 back, and it would hit the x to the 10, giving us x to the 100. All right, now remember what we said about sine x over x. This is a really useful limit, but to use it, what we need is this form. We need sine of a thing over that thing. Now, in this problem, we have sine of all of this junk, and of course, all of this junk is not in the denominator. We would need this junk in the denominator in order to apply that familiar limit. So what we're going to do inside this fraction is multiply by this over itself. So we're just multiplying by one, but it's gonna let us get this expression in the denominator. All right, we've got a good thing going now. So notice we just multiplied by this over itself. So we haven't actually changed the value of anything, but now we have sine of two sine to the 10 of three X over two sine to the 10 of three X. Of course, there's more down here as well, but that's what we're focused on right now. Now, in order to apply the known fact that this limit sine X over X as X approaches zero is one, we would need this thing inside of sine to be approaching zero. Well, thankfully X is approaching zero and as X approaches zero, so too does two sine to the 10 of three X. Of course, that's because the sine function is continuous and sine of zero is zero, and all of these transformations to the function don't break its continuity. So this thing inside that sine function is going to zero. It's being divided by that input as well, and of course that, again, is going to zero. So we have what we need, sine of stuff over stuff, as that stuff goes to zero. This then is equal to one, and what remains is the other junk, this, and the x to the 10 of the denominator. Once more, this over this is really just this, but written differently, and so we can just replace it with one. Oftentimes, to make this sort of thing more explicit, people will name this junk, so they might call this y and call this y and say, look, this is the limit of sine y over y as y goes to zero. I'm not gonna bother with all that though. This is enough writing as it is. All right, so knowing this goes to one, let's continue. So now all we have left is two sine to the 10 of three X over X to the 10. Of course, this whole thing is still being raised to the power of 10. There's an obvious thing to do now, which is to take two to the power of 10 out of the limit. That's just a constant factor. So we can just slide that out. And then take this exponent of 10 that's common to sine and x, take that out and it'll be an exponent of 100. So we're bringing two to the 10 outside of the limit. So we have two to the 10 times the limit as x approaches zero of sine of three x over x all to the power now of 100. And again, that's because we took that common exponent of 10 out. So now we'd have 10 times 10 or 100. And now we're back in the situation of having sine of stuff over different stuff. We'd like this in the denominator to be the same stuff. 3x here and 1x here. How do we make this 3x? Well, just multiply it by three. But of course, if we're gonna multiply by three in the denominator, we also have to multiply by three in the numerator. So in total, we haven't changed anything. And guess what? We are done now. This is sine of 3x over 3x, and that's going to zero because x is going to zero. Certainly as x goes to zero, so two does three x. So this stuff here is just one. So in effect, it cancels out because it's one, 
And then all we have is 3 to the power of 100. So final answer is 2 to the power of 10 multiplied by 3 to the power of 100. And this is a massive number totaling 51 digits. It is roughly 528 quindecillion. And I'm hoping they make at least this many editions of Stuart's Calculus, because if they do, my first editions will be worth so much, I could probably afford at least one more cat calculator. I'm on table, I'm doing an art to keep the cable cut and untucked the table. If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal. I wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm jaded. Hate the odds that I calculated. Press and pull and pray and push it all the way through the whole blue planet. Faded. Psychosomatic habits, why you so, so.